Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's afternoon Bible study uh, live stream. Today, we're going to be jumping into Job chapter 31. So I invite you to grab your Bibles and read along with me as we read through Job chapter 31. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you like a physical Bible, uh, send me a private message. I'd love to try to hook you up with one. Uh, but for now, you can go to BibleGateway.com or use the Bible app. Uh, those are my suggestions to, to read along. Um, so before we get into Job's final protest of innocence, I just want to take a second to reflect on what we read a couple days ago. Um, I do apologize for not showing up uh, yesterday, but I'm feeling a lot better now. There's a little bit of a cold going around. So, uh, you know, Lord, if anyone's battling with a cold right now, um, may you bring swift healing to their bodies to their throats, their nasal passages, and uh, protect uh, their family and stuff uh, from catching it as well. In your name, Lord. I just thought I'd get that out of the way because sometimes it can be hard to focus on God and reading and whatnot when you have the cold. Um, it's really hard to speak, uh, especially since mine was a lot in the throat. Uh, and I'm already feeling it right now with the amount of speaking that I am doing. So... One second. <coughs> if I'm not speaking, I'm not coughing. But now when I'm speaking a lot, I feel like I have to cough a lot. So hopefully this goes by okay. Lord, please help this go by okay. Uh, so yesterday in, or two days ago in Job chapter 30, we were talking about um, Job's anguishes. And he was just talking about his anguishes. And a lot of it had to do with like kind of his reputation a lot of it had to do with, um, you know, just feeling, um, you know, like God had abandoned him and stuff. And, uh, you know, just he's sad. He's battling depression. The thing that really stood out at me is here's this rich guy who, you know, had everything that the world kind of wants to offer. And in his, you know, lament, his anguish, he... Ha dedicates like one sentence to it um you know we can get so fixated on that's the most important thing and yet you know job after losing his family and his health that is about one sentence of everything um that uh you know of his anguish so i thought that was interesting uh so yeah Let's jump in now to Job chapter 31. This very first verse uh, is something highlighted uh, in the New uh, Testament, something that points towards Jesus. Also, verses 7 uh, and the beginning of verse 8. So um, after we're done reading, I'll go back and uh, read those and give those descriptions. And I'll give you my reaction and what I've gotten out of this verse. And I shouldn't talk with my hands because I'm sure this messes up your audio. So I'll try to keep my hand somewhat uh, normal. But there's nowhere to pin my little lapel mic on my t-shirt. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> without further ado, let's jump into Job chapter 31. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. For what has God above chosen for us? What is our inheritance from the Almighty on high? Isn't it calamity for the wicked and misfortune for those who do evil? Doesn't he see everything I do and every step I take? Have I lied to anyone or deceived anyone? Let God weigh me on scales on the scales of justice, for he knows my integrity. If I have strayed away from his path, or if my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, or if I'm guilty of any other sin, then let someone else eat the crops I have planted. Let all that I have planted be uprooted. If my heart has been seduced by a woman, or if I have lusted for my neighbor's wife, then let my wife severe, uh, serve another man. Let, my, uh, let other men sleep with her. For if... For lust is a shameful sin, a crime that should be punished. It is a fire that burns all the way to hell. It would wipe out everything 
I own. If I had been unfair to my male or female servants when they brought their complaints to me, how could I face God? What could I say when he questioned me? For God created both me and my servants. He created us both in the womb. Have I refused to help the poor or crush the hopes of widows? Have I been stingy with my food or refused to share it with orphans? No. From childhood, I have cared for orphans like a father. And all my life, I have cared for widows. Whenever I saw the homeless without clothes, they needed, uh, and the needy with nothing to wear, did they not praise me? Another page. Do, 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 do. Um, for uh, providing wool and clothing for them, uh, for uh, for providing wool clothing to keep them warm. If I raised my ha hand against an orphan, knowing the judges would take my side then let my shoulder be wretched out of place. Let my arm be torn from its socket. That would be better than facing God's judgment, for the majesty of God opposes me. What hope is there? For if the majesty of God opposes me, what hope is there? Have I put my trust in money or felt secure because of my gold? I Have I gloated about my wealth and all that I own? Have I looked at the sun shining in the skies or the moon walking down its silver pathway and been secretly enticed by my heart to throw kisses at them in worship? If so, I should be punished by the judges for it would mean I have denied the God of heaven. Have I ever rejoiced when disaster struck my enemies or became excited when harm came their way? No. Have I ever sinned by cursing anyone or by asking for revenge? My servants have never said he let others go hungry. Have I ever turned away a stranger but have opened up my doors to everyone? Have I tried to hide my sins like other people do, concealing my guilt in my heart? Have I feared the crowd or the contempt of the masses? So I kept quiet and stayed indoors. If only someone would listen to me. Look, I am signing my name to my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. I would face the accusation proudly. I would wear it like a crown. For I would tell him exactly what I have done. I would come before him like a prince. If my land accuses me and all its Furos cry out together. Or if I have stolen its crops or murdered its owners, then let thistles grow on the land instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. Job's words are ended. May God add a blessing to the reading of Job chapter 31. All right. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, I like this one. Um... But before I get into what I like about it, um, I'm just going to highlight the parts in blue. There was actually one other part in blue. I didn't know that until I flipped the page. Um, so verse 1, uh, 31, 1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Job 31, 1. Jesus affirms the mindset that Job shares here when he later tells us what we are guilt that. We are guilty not only of things we do, but of the things our hearts intend to do that only he can see. Matthew 5, 17 uh, to 84. Yeah, that's the, like, okay, you've heard it not to lust after one, but I tell you, or, you know, not to do whatever, but I tell you, you know, and he basically doubles down on, on that. And he makes it like, even if your eyes are wandering and, you know, you're becoming, uh, you know, you're starting to covet this woman and you're looking lustfully at her. You're turning her from, you know, a beautiful creation into an object for your pleasure. That's not okay. Uh, and that's in the Beatitudes. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's really, 
really important. And especially he's still married at this time too, right? I'm not going to look lustfully and chase after all these other young women because I'm committed to my wife. Uh, so that's a really, really big thing. Uh, verse seven. So 31, seven uh, and a little bit of um, part eight. If I have strayed away from his pathway or if my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, it could be money, the you know women, whatever, uh, or if I am guilty of any other sin, then let someone else eat the crops I have planted. So here, Job says, let someone else eat the crops I have planted. Later, Jesus tells his disciples, you know the saying, one plants and another harvest. That saying comes from Job's mouth right here. John 4, 3 to 7, uh, 37. So it's kind of cool. A nice little callback Jesus calls back to this part. Um, you know, because we are all sinful. So we need that team of people. God does all of the heavy lifting there. Uh, and it's cool that Jesus calls back to this. I don't think I would have made that connection. That's, that's nice. Um, and then Job 31, uh, verses 35 and 36. If only someone would listen to me, look, I will sign my name to my defense. Let the almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out my charges against me. I would face the accusation proudly. I would wear it like a crown. Job challenges his accuser to write out the charges against me. He will carry it on his shoulder and bind it to himself like a crown. Later, Jesus has his charges written out and nailed to the cross, which carries on his shoulders to Golgotha while wearing a crown of thorn branches. Matthew 27, uh, chapter 27, verses 27 to 40. Yeah, and this is probably uh, the thing that stood out the most to me. So that connection and that foreshadowing to Jesus, uh, you know, where he literally carries the cross. You can see a little bit of like uh, a, a artistic depiction of a cross behind me there. Um, you know, and he carried that cross and then he has that crown of thorns lowered down uh, where the accusations of him, uh, you know, and he ends up bearing the, the sin of all of us on his shoulders. And it's pushed down like a crown on his head because he is the king of all of us sinners. And he makes us right and reconciles us to God. Because we've all fallen short. And his crown is a crown of broken people. Bring them to the perfect God. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of what I'm getting out of that. And um, I, I like this. Job, he's like, I don't think I've done any of these things, but here are all of the sins. This is what I've gotten out of this. Here are all the sins. He knows what it is, and he is saying, let consequences come. If this is how it is, this is how we perceive, you know, justice and how we perceive God's actions. If this is how God works, and if I have sinned, let this stuff happen. Let, you know, if I sin this way, which would have, you know, granted me, you know, extra stuff in this place, then take it away. Take it away. If that's what it is, he's opening himself up and he's like, I have done my best to keep the commands of God and to, to be faithful and to do all of these things. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Uh, the one other big thing that stood out to me, like, sorry, two thoughts are going through my head. Um, I'm going to stay with the last one. Job would be confident to go up to the accuser and be like, ah, you're saying all of these things. I am confident I can stand before you and I can stand before God because I have made the best efforts to live the right way. And I have been thinking about all of these things and I cannot think of a time when I have fallen short on these things. You know, have any of my servants been like, you know, oh, he let us go hungry and he starved us? No. Have I treated them unfairly? No. And why would I? I mean, 
they're created by God. I'm created by God. You know, we're all equal under God's eyes. So like, why would I do that? No, I treat them fairly. Um, you know, and he goes and he does all of these lists. And by the way, that is one of the big things too. Like we have slavery um, in some pretty twisted ways compared to what it was like in the Bible. When the Bible talks about uh, like Jewish people, um, you know, being able to own slaves and stuff like that, it was for a limited time basis. Um, and, you know, you had to treat them with a lot of dignity. It was almost like a modern day job um, that you had a seven year commitment to. Um, it, it looks closer to that that we have now than to what uh, how we picture slavery now because of like more modern day examples of slavery, modern day, even like to 200 years ago, um, you know. But when we were thinking like 3,000 years ago, it looked different. The meaning and how things worked were, were very, very different. Um, so keep that in mind because I know that that can sound touchy. Well, Job had slaves, so therefore, you know, like, wow. And it's easy to jump on them uh, when we come at it from our modern day context. But basically, he was like a business owner. And he had employees. So, um, yeah. Uh, but then the big thing, the accuser, we know who the accuser is. The accuser is Lucifer, right? It's Satan. Satan is the accuser. We got that in, in number one. So he's willing to stand face to face with the accuser and be like, no, I have not sinned. Um, and like to the best of Job's knowledge, he hasn't. Right. And even God going like, I haven't laid down all the rules yet. So like, yeah, Job hasn't. Right. He hasn't acted in such a way like he is honorable. Um, and like God stands up for Job and all of these bad things are happening, not because of the sin that Job has. And that's, you know, that experience. But basically. Here, Job's not challenging God, he's challenging the accuser, he's challenging Satan. And one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, you know, Job here is advocating for himself, but we don't have to advocate for ourselves. We have fallen short. But Jesus, you know, washes us clean, clean of that guilt uh, and that punishment. Right. Uh, and Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, uh, is our advocate, advocating on our behalf. So the role of uh, Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit is to advocate for us. And Lucifer, Satan, his job is he is the accuser, right? So we have that set up with the Holy Spirit defending Job at the beginning. And, you know, because the Holy Spirit had not come down to earth yet. And um, we have Lucifer being the accuser. And Job's basically like, I'm willing to face my accuser face to face. He's almost challenging Lucifer here, which is interesting but oh man how great is it that um you know we don't have to defend ourselves because we know we have fallen short we know that we have sinned we have what the sins are are laid out and like job even takes some of the more intense uh versions of what sin is that jesus gets to you know like oh you've heard it say this but you know it's actually like this starting off in our minds not necessarily our actions. Um, so like Job is like really, really on point here. Um, and he's like, yeah, bring on my accuser. But we don't have to do that because we know we've fallen short. But God does that on our behalf. Isn't that awesome? We don't have to be our own advocates. That's the big takeaway from this. Job is his own advocate. You and I, we don't have to be our own advocates because that is what God is doing for us. And he will stand face to face with the accuser and declare us clean, declare us righteous because our sins are forgiven because of what Christ did on the cross. Let us pray. AJC, awesome Jesus Christ. I thank you for all the foreshadowing to things in the New Testament, all the lessons that can be learned. And Lord, um, as we 
I, you know, uh, are, are thinking about all the sin. And as the enemy brings it up and the accuser starts accusing, I think he's that you are the advocate. So help us to see ourselves more soberly and not see ourselves as less and unworthy because you have made us worthy. You are standing up on our behalf and you are our advocate, Lord. Defending us from the accusations from the accuser. Who is Lucifer? On the spiritual realm and the spiritual battles, you stand up, you defend us, and you make us righteous. You make us clean. It's not by anything that we do. So may we not wear it with, with pride, but with humbleness. Pointing others towards you and what you have done. And while we were still sinners, you died for us. So thank you, Lord, for faithfully loving us, creating us, and dwelling among us. And advocating on our behalf. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day. And I will catch you on uh, the other side. Have a great day. God bless.